Seekers, that was Cannonball by the Breeders. Special request from my wife, Adriana. So uh, there you go, Adriana. That was Cannonball for you. I hope you enjoyed it. it. Took me a long time to figure out how to get that right. The bass line itself wasn't hard, but getting the packing and making it all work out, God, it took forever, and I did a whole bunch of wrong things. And I don't know how long I'm going to keep doing these musical intros, or at least I'm going to have to simplify them if I want to keep doing them. Okay. So, you didn't come for the music, you came for the Zen. So let me tell you about the Zen. Somebody in the comments section of an older video, I get the comments as they come in, not, not per video, so I get like a notification to come. So this was a comment for an older video, and the commenter asked why in Zen we don't talk about mindfulness and states of mindfulness when this is a really, really important thing in early Buddhism, and of course the Buddha talked a lot about it. So there's a whole lot of stuff to unpack here, and I'm probably not going to get to it all in one video, but part of it has to do with the relationship between early Buddhism and the other forms of Buddhism, the Mahayana forms of Buddhism, of which Zen is one. And a lot of people, when they get their Buddhism here in the West, they're getting everything all at once. They're getting the whole history of Buddhism all at once. So they get a bunch of early Buddhism and they're probably getting it a lot in college courses, university courses and things like that. And you know, maybe they're getting it from a center or something. And then they get all the later forms of Buddhism and it all comes in a package. So they don't understand why later forms of Buddhism like Zen kind of ignore what it says in early Buddhism. That's not what we do in Christianity. In Christianity we have the scriptures, you know, we have the New Testament and the Old Testament and they are, they are set and they are set in stone as it were. I mean they may be set in stone somewhere but they're kind of, they're canonized. And in Buddhism you have what's loosely called the Pali Canon, although I guess it's canonized according to the Theravada sect, but you have a lot of writings, okay? So you have tons and tons of Buddhist writings. From what I've heard, there are more writings about Buddhism than any other religion in the world. And there's no set canon other than like I said, the Pali Canon for the Theravada sect, they take the earliest scriptures written in Pali and consider them to be kind of like the way Christians consider the Bible as a set group of texts that cannot be altered and that are the texts, you know. In other forms of Buddhism, this just really isn't the case. I can't speak to every form of Buddhism, but it, particularly in Zen, there's no canon everything is just there and there are certain pieces certain sutras and things that are more highly regarded and more often used than others in the Soto school of Buddhism in which I was trained Shobo Genzo which was written by Dogen 800 years ago is very highly regarded and it's but it's not regarded as a scripture it's not that ancient as far as ancient scriptures in the Soto school really uh, the Heart Sutra is a big deal, and that's about it. There's other things like the Platform Sutra and other ancient sutras that are that come in and out of play, but really the Heart Sutra is the only one I know of that's, that's just always there. And the Heart Sutra is a very, very short piece. I did 
the Heart Sutra on this channel before, so if you want to go search it, you can hear me chant the Heart Sutra, and it's only in English fits on one page. It's only in English fits on one page. I sound like a German immigrant speaking English. Anyway, it, it's only fits on one. I guess my, my ancestors were German immigrants, so maybe that's why I lapse into that sometimes. Anyway, so it fits on one page, so it's a really short thing. So in the in Soto Zen, there isn't really, uh, we don't look at those, those early Buddhist scriptures and go, those are the words of Buddha, Buddha said it, I believe it, that settles it, kind of thing. It just, it just doesn't happen. Uh, Dogen, though, is kind of interesting in that among, the Zenis just tend to ignore what they call the Hinayana scriptures, which are the Pali Canon, which are the ones that if you take a university class in Buddhism, you're going to learn a lot about because they're the earliest scriptures of Buddhism. In Zen, they tend to be ignored, except Dogen. Dogen doesn't ignore the Pali scriptures. He doesn't talk a lot about them, but he references them more than most Zen teachers, uh, contemporary or Zen teachers from his time. So he does it, but he doesn't ever talk about uh, concentration. So when people, well, when this person who asked, asked about mindfulness, I gathered from the context of the question that the question wasn't really so much about mindfulness, but about states of concentration, because mindfulness usually refers to learning states of concentration, and in the Pali Canon, there are a lot of scriptures about how uh, the different states of jhana, and jhana is basically the same word that became dhyana, then became uh, chan, then became zen. So it's zen is the word, but we ignore these states of zen, as it were, these states of jhana. And it just so happens, <laughs> lucky you, that I address this in my new book. And I didn't really intend for this to be an ad for my new book, but it is, and so go out and buy it and make it a million seller. But I do talk about this, and I just thought I would read you the section in which I talk about the jhanas, the different levels of concentration. So here we go. In early Buddhism, samadhi, that's a, well, we won't worry about that, that state of concentration was described as follows, and here's a quote from the Pali Canon. There is the case where a monk, quite withdrawn from sensuality, withdrawn from unskillful mental qualities, enters and remains in the first jhana, which is described as rapture and pleasure born from withdrawal accomplished by directed thought and evaluation. With the stilling of directed thoughts and evaluation, he enters and remains in the second jhana, rapture and pleasure born of composure, unification of awareness, free from directed thought and evaluation, internal assurance. Okay. With the fading of rapture, he remains equanimous, mindful, and alert, and senses pleasure with the body. He enters and remains in the third jhana. Let's do it like a German person would in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare equanimous and mindful he has a pleasant abiding. With the abandoning of pleasure and stress, as with the earlier disappearance of elation and distress, in distress, okay, he enters and remains in the fourth jhana, or I don't know how we do that like that. Anyway, the fourth jhana, purity of equanimity and mindfulness, neither pleasure nor pain. This is called right concentration or samadhi. Okay, that's the quote from the Pali scriptures. And now here's what Brad says about that in this book. Jhana is the Pali pronunciation of the Sanskrit word dhyana, which is usually translated as meditation. And I mentioned that what I just told you, that it's the same word as zen. Okay, so skipping along. Uh, in Zen tradition, in the Zen tradition, we rarely talk about jhanas, at least not in the sense of there being distinct levels. As you can figure out from context, in the older forms of Buddhism, the various jhanas were different states or levels of meditation. In this example, they seem to lead from one to the other, getting better and better until at last you end up in the fourth jhana, which is the bestest jhana of them all. The problem with this system, for me, is that it involves comparing things that cannot be compared. How do you judge which number jhana you're in? I suppose you could compare it to the descriptions you've heard or read of that jhana. For example, you could ask yourself if you're feeling rapture and pleasure born from withdrawal. If the answer is yes, then you'd know you're in jhana number one. 
But what does rapture and pleasure born from withdrawal feel like? I certainly don't know. Maybe I could guess based on what sort of feelings and images words like rapture, pleasure, and withdrawal evoke. But then I'm really just comparing my actual state at this moment with my imagination. Or maybe if I've accomplished jhanas number one and two, leaving aside for the moment how I'd know I did that, I could compare my memories of those states with whatever I'm feeling at this moment. If I'm not feeling what I remember feeling in those states, and if instead I feel equanimous and mindful and have a pleasant abiding, I might declare that I'm in jhana number three. What's a pleasant abiding, you ask? I'll be darned if I know. I'm not even sure what being equanimous feels like. I guess it feels kind of equal all over, or something. You tell me. I suppose I could make a vague guess as to what feeling neither pleasure nor pain would be like, but if I had to guess at that one, I'd guess that it just feels kind of normal. Like maybe the feeling I get on a day that's not too hot or cold, while sitting on a couch that's not very nice but also not too bad, and watching a TV show that I neither enjoy very much nor hate. But how would I be certain if I'd accomplished jhanas one and two if, and hadn't made a mistake? Well, I guess I could ask my teacher, which would mean I could describe to her my memories of how I felt at a particular time in the past. This would invoke in her images and feelings associated with the words I used, and she could compare those images and feelings to memories of her own past states of jhana and use that comparison to guess if I'd reached those states too. Then she could either confirm my meditative accomplishments or deny them. So that's what I wrote in the book. And that's my problem with the whole idea of meditative states. And it's probably the reason that the Zen tradition abandoned them, as I think other people probably noticed this same thing, is that, is that you're just comparing things to one another. You're comparing you know, the apple that you ate yesterday to the apple you ate you're eating right now and saying okay this apple is better than that apple but you don't know what that apple was because it's in the past and it's gone and 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 now you're eating this apple and what the zen tradition asks you to do is be fully immersed in eating this apple you know if to continue the stupid metaphor you know be fully immersed in exactly this moment and don't try to compare it Dogen is also really down on the idea of trying to like, like make enhanced states of concentration. There's one famous line in Shobo Genzo, I think it's in Bendoa, where he says, what I'm talking about is not Zen concentration. Shu Zen is the word he uses. And so he's kind of against this idea of of establishing special states of concentration. For a lot of people, for a lot of people in various meditative traditions, Buddhist and otherwise, this sounds nuts, you know, and it's probably why I get this question a lot from uh, commenters. They're like, well, you have to concentrate, you have to establish, you know, a form of, of intense concentration because that's what meditation is all about. It's intense concentration. And usually that's what meditation is described as if you look it up in um, you know the old Encyclopedia Britannica or I don't know how Wikipedia defines it these days but when I first looked up meditation I learned it as a it was supposed to be a state of intense concentration and so I would do zazen and I'd be like well this is not intense concentration this is just my mind just going whoa you know everything's coming out so that's the different approach. It's a totally different approach. I've never tried to get into those intense states of concentration, so I probably shouldn't criticize them. But I feel like any time you set up an image of, okay, here's an intense, I'm going to establish intense concentration. I'm going to try to concentrate so hard that I never hear Ziggy barking. So I try to establish intense, intense concentration, and in my mind what that looks like is the state where Ziggy barks and I can't hear him. So I've established an image of the state that I want to achieve, and then I make my efforts to realize that image, to make that image come into reality. But I've just, I'm just working on my imagination. It's something created by my ego. The same 
thing that has made the big mistake about this world that has caused me so much trouble and so much strife is now trying to get into the meditation business and is trying to tell me what meditation is about. Zen takes the completely opposite approach and says, let's see what the natural state is and yeah, you do establish a kind of a state of quietness. So there is that. There's the kind of outward trappings of meditation where you do it in a quiet space. You sit very still. You sit in a specific posture trying to get your nervous system aligned uh, by aligning the actual nerves in your body in a, in a straight line. And you sit there and then everything's off. Then, then you're not doing anything else. There's nothing else to do. Uh, that's the, the hard part. Everybody wants to put something in there. Okay, I'm sitting still. Now what do I do? You know, and, and es establishing a state of intense concentration sounds like a good thing to do because you're just looking at the wall, right? So what are you going to do other than establish a state of heightened concentration? But the Zen system, at least Dogen's way of describing it, and I asked my friend Gento, uh, uh, Shozan Jack Haubner, about this, and he says it's, an, it's the same in the Rinzai tradition. You're not trying to establish any anything else. You're just trying to be in the state that you're already in. And I keep making this form, and it looks like I'm doing like a 50s lady, but I'm doing a meditator. So this is his head, and then his legs come out like this. So anyway, that's that's what that gesture means. But that's that's what you do. So there is there is no there is no attempt to establish a state of special concentration, and that's the reason why. So there you go. Uh, also, hey, uh, thank you for responding. A lot of people, a bunch of people responded to my plea for help with my audiobook, and I found somebody who's helping me with it now, and I also uh, got a little tutorial in the comments, so I'm simultaneously working on it myself, and there's somebody else working on it for me. Who, and, and we'll see which one gets it done first, I guess, uh, and then uh, and then we'll uh, we'll put it up. So I hope this will solve the problem with the audiobook, and the audiobook will be available in however many weeks it takes Audible to process the thing. We will see. But now it, it sounds like it sounds super perfect to me. So I don't know what it's going to sound like to them. It sounded fine before, but now it sounds like super duper quiet. Oh well. I guess if people like that sort of thing. I'm a fan of Guided by Voices and those lo-fi bands, so I don't care if there's a little bit of hiss and stuff. Anyway, if you want to contribute to me doing more of what I do, you can go to the URL that you're seeing on the screen below, which is hardcorezen.info, probably around here somewhere, slash donate. hardcorezen.info slash donate. hardcorezen.info slash donate. Uh, that is where you will find links to my PayPal and Patreon accounts. Those are my main and usually only ways of making a living. So I appreciate your support a lot. And thank you very much. But as always, this is offered for free. And there's a butterfly flying around. And that butterfly is free. Butterflies are free to fly. Anyway, it's free like that butterfly. So you don't have to pay if you don't want to pay. We will see you next time. Have a good time all the time. Hey, Ziggy. Whoa. Hey, Ziggy. Ziggy. Where are you? Are you back that way? Ziggy, come here, come here, come here, Ziggy. Come. Ziggy, make your cameo. Say hi to the folks. You see the? Oh, he's catching a fly. Anyway, there's Ziggy. There's his cameo. Bye, Ziggy. <laughs> <laughs>